It's my pleasure to welcome you. I'm Mark Koenig. I'm the director of the Presbyterian Ministry at the United Nations and one of the co-chairs of the Israel-Palestine Working Group, which is the sponsor of this event. Uh, today's event looks is that we're looking at refusing to occupy militarism in Israeli society and the resistance to it. And we are honored to have with us two speakers today, uh, Danielle Yaor, uh, and she is a refusenik. Um, she told me I didn't have to try to do the Israeli pronunciation. Um, and and uh, she's part of the organization of young Israelis who refuse compulsory service in the Israeli military. In a 2014 open letter to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, they cite the dehuman dehumanization of Palestinians living under occupation as one of their reasons for refusing service. Uh, they also contend that Israeli society is negatively impacted by the pervasive militarism that fosters violence and discrimination. Um, Danielle also participates with other human rights organizations in Israel, and she is active in weekly popular protests against the separation wall. Uh, and, and Danielle is, is to my immediate left, and then beyond uh, is Sahar Vardi. Sahar coordinates the Israel, Israel program for the American Friends Service Committee, AFSC, uh, focusing on countering the militarization of Israeli society. She's been promoting coexistence since working as a small child with her Israeli father, planting trees in Palestinian villages. Conscripted into the Israeli Defense Forces at age 18, uh, Sahar was imprisoned for her refusal to serve. Uh, prior to her work with AFSC, uh, Sahar worked with the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, uh, the Sheikh Jarrah, Sheikh Jarrah Solidarity Movement, uh, and was involved in protesting Israel's eviction of Palestinians from their homes. And so it's my pleasure now to introduce Danielle and Sahar. My understanding is we'll have about a 30 minute presentation total, and then there'll be time for Q&A. Okay, uh, as I said, I'll, I will serve you to tell you about my home and about my life in general in Israel. Okay, um, well, at my home, we never had a political discussion because we never connect between our, our problem to the occupation, and this is one of the biggest problems of the Israeli society. Um, when I started to develop my awareness to the occupation, I was 15 years old. Yeah, it's, it's really right. It's re I, I think it's kind of late, but in Israel, um, you cannot uh, be so aware of that because um, the, educa the education system never taught me that there is an occupation and there is a, the other side of the Palestinian. And when I started to develop my awareness, I was 15 years old, as I said, and I study philosophy. And I study about the philosopher John Rawls to talk about civil disobedience and my teacher role and refuser as well. And of course, he cannot speak with us about the occupation because um, a teacher in the education system in Israel, um, it's, not, it's not legal to speak about those things. Um, even um, in addition to that, um, if there are students, uh, if more students are uh, servicing the army, he gets for more money for that and he gets a kind of bonus of that. And when I, when he thought to us about the, about John Walls and about um, the civil disobedience, um, I understand that there is another side and there is the option of refusing. And then I started to collect a lot of information from website, from books, for what, it, what that can I get from everything. And I just started to study by my own about the occupation. And um, then a year, about, the, about a year from then, I went to a summer camp, um, a youth camp, um, that it's kind of an alternative camp in Israel that speak about those things, think about uh, the Palestinian and the occupation and the depressions in our society in general. And then we were visiting in a, a two, a two Palestinian uh, Christian village, Crete and Biram. Uh, those village are uh, destroyed in uh, 1948 uh, with uh, 700 villages. And those daily uh, build, uh, 
daily middle uh, daily life are uh, really tough. They're uh, every every time they're trying to build a house or even build everything you want. They the police just destroy that. Uh, they're trying to reach their land. Um, they're trying <laughs> just to live a normal life and they cannot do it. And then I just couldn't. It couldn't be part of, uh, and and couldn't be part of uh, the society that destroyed other uh, later, um, later group that um, occupied by a bigger group, um, and that's what happened also in uh, to the Palestinians. So I decided that I can be part of that, and I have to refuse. Um, and then I started to reach to. A lot of other groups, um, and in Israel, it's really hard because this is this awareness is it's really hard to reach to that. Uh, I mean, to to come to the letter, you need to be really aware of that, and to come to those kind of group of people. Um, and if you are living not not in Tel Aviv, and not in the places that uh, collect all those people, and they are a kind of community, it's really hard to get them. So, um, because you don't know about them, and and then in this camp, I, I I met all those people, and I joined the letter, and we wrote the letter. Um, in our letter, we against the occupation, and we uh, chose not to go to the military um, because of the occupation and some other uh, depressions in our society, uh, like. Um, since we are young, we are learning to admire this masculine, this masculine uh, soldiers who solve his problem with violence, and those violence values are um, are deep inside of us uh, as a society. And since I was young, I was against those values, and I thought that I have to refuse and I have to not be part of that. Uh, so this is also one of. Uh, the things is wrote in the letter. Um, it's also um, uh, it also touches on. Touches on. It's also touches on to the feminism uh, criticism um, that we against uh, this uh, this prison that uh, highlights this masculine men. Um, that shows again and again in our society. And it's also a fact to our society to be more militaristic and more deeply inspired of violence. And this is uh, what, 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 why we chose to refuse the, the military. Um, we would like to read to you the letter, if you want to. <laughs> So I'll just read it out. Um, so this is the 2014 Refuses Letter Against the Occupation. This letter was sent out in March 2014 to the Prime Minister, um, and Daniel is one of the people who signed it, uh, together with now 150, yep. right? 150 Israeli youth. We are Israeli citizens designated to be drafted into the Israeli military. We ask those reading this letter to set aside what seems to be obvious and reconsider the true meaning of military service. We, the undersigned, intend to refuse our military service, and the main reason for our refusal is our opposition to the occupation of the Palestinian territories by the military. Palestinians in the occupied territories live under the rule of the Israeli government, although they did not elect it and have no legal means to influence its decisions. This and so we cannot, in good conscience, take part in the system that perpetuates the actions mentioned above. Our refusal is the result of much thought, and we pay the price for our choice. We call upon our peers, soldiers in regular service, reserved service soldiers, the citizens of Israel as a whole, to reconsider their positions regarding the occupation, the draft, and the place of the military in Israeli civil society. We believe in the power of citizens to change the reality on the ground and create a more fair and just society. Our refusal is a testimony to that belief. Um, so this is the letter, and we're a group of, as I said, 150 teenagers from all over the country. 
uh, between the ages 16 to 21. 21, uh, this is the ages you're going out from the army. And um, we do, we're doing a lot of other activities. Um, as you see, um, we talk in a lot of the media, we got interview. Um, we got interviewed to the CNN, um, to the social TV, and etc. And uh, we do we do also an activities. Um, um, for example, uh, in Protective Edge, uh, at the last attack in Gaza in the last summer, um, we did uh, an an action um, in um, the center of Tel Aviv. Uh, Rothschild Street, um, we hang uh, a teacher covered in fake blood to show uh, the number of the people that died just in the, in when projective edge started. Uh, it was more than 200 people just in the start of uh, protective edge. Uh, we wanted to show to the Israeli society that there, there is an other side that died and killed all the time. And when they, when a soldier die, or a young people, or a child died in Israel. All the society freaked out, and just uh, and when a Palestinian die, is anonymous. No, nobody know them, and nobody care about them. Um, he dying, and his name is. He doesn't have a name. He doesn't have a. It doesn't have an, it doesn't have nothing, and we wanted to show to the Israeli society that you, there is an other side that died all the time, and we we did a graffiti graffiti um, uh, that wrote uh, on on Rochester Street that there is more than two hundred people dying in Gaza and stop the killing, and it's time to refuse. Um, we did another activity in the end of Protective Edge. Uh, we hang uh, poster, fake posters uh, that the IDF called to uh, soldiers and people to refuse the army uh, from the IDF. Um, but it's not the IDF. And we reward there uh, a lot of uh, statistic. Um, Information, statistic information about uh, what's happening uh, in Gaza. Um, this was on the end of uh, Protective Edge, and we were there in the end of Protective Edge, there were more than 2,000 people that died. And again, we wanted to show to the Israeli society that people are suffering. And we hang all over Tel Aviv, and it was really cool. <laughs> um, what is that? Uh, a little bit of it. Yeah. Um, well, the title is The IDF Calls Its Soldiers to Refuse Illegal Orders. Uh, and then it goes on and saying, Dear soldiers, due to the uh, latest uh, activities in Protective Edge that are illegal and immoral, uh, we call you to refuse these orders, um, and so on. Kind of elaborates on that, on the amount of people who are killed, and so on. Um, in Israel, um, the messenger of the people who, when, who are not part of the army, they called a uh, drafted judger, and not the drafted judger, and not to take the responsibility about your society. And it's not true. Um, the people that chose to refuse are taking the responsibility that the country does not take and put a stop to the blood cycle that Israel created with the, war, uh, the crime war that she does. Um, the service in the army is not a protection on the country as the education system trying to teach us since we are young. It's a donation to a blood cycle um, and that why the act of the refusing is so important and so important to the Israeli society and the Palestinians as well. <laughs> um, as a citizen of Israel, um, I'm part of a country that put in, in the base on the on Israel on Israel society uh, the 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 code of security. But it's not a security, it's a Again, it's a blood cycle, and 
to take um, a part of the narrative that choose not to be part of, um, of the IDF and put it at the end to the militaristic violence and to the racism and 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 etc. <laughs> um, it's very really important uh, to our society in general. Um, the support of uh, the support of um, of the Israeli uh, refusing movement. It's really important because many teenagers are not aware to what happened uh, in the other side, as I wasn't aware when I was. 15 years old, and as I said, most of the people, most of the young people, don't know about the occupation, and and if you are choosing to be an objector, um, it's really hard for your families and um, for, for my family as well. My family, I'm not in touch with uh, part of my family because they think that I, that people like me. Um, uh, a cancer to the nation, and uh, the the choosing of object the army, it's hurting the society, and that's why it's so important to support um, the objectors, and because they have to pay a really social price, because if you're an objector, you're a, an outsider um, from every social level, and it's really hard. So. This was me. Thank you so much. <laughs>
the picture that you see here on the left um, is a program called Teacher Soldiers. Uh, the Israeli Defense Force, as there is conscription, also has quite a lot of excessive manpower. Specifically, I would say woman power. Um, and what they do, among other things, with all these mostly women, is that they send them to go teach at different schools. So they will teach math or English or Hebrew or anything, uh, usually in the poorest schools. They can't afford enough teachers. So this is the state's way to compensate for that. So you'll have teachers on uniform teaching you math. Um, the other picture there is from a, a high school. Um, and the soldier there, who came with his weapon into a classroom, um, is explaining to them about leadership. It's not specifically about the army, it's just a leadership program. And what is the best way to show leadership, if not soldiers? Um, in the 11th grade, most schools go out to a week of basic training in a military camp as part of school activity. So you'll go out with all your classmates to a military camp, wear a uniform, learn how to take orders, and learn how to shoot as part of school activity. So this is something that's very fundamental in the education system. Um, and here, if we go back to this slide, the picture on the right here is very interesting because it tells not only the connection between the military and education, but also what is the narrative that is kind of drawn around that. And what you see here in the picture is the head of the South District of the Ministry of Education and the head of the South District of the Israeli Defense Force. Um, the soldier, this general, was just retiring, so they had this nice goodbye thing uh, in which she was thanking him for the years of working together. And again, this is the head of the South District of the Ministry of Education. Um, while she's thanking him, he gave her a present. And I don't know if you can see this picture very well, but there are three pictures in it. Um, the left picture is a sculpture. It's on the um, gates of Jerusalem, the old city. Uh, and it's a sculpture of uh, Jews taking out relics and, and anything they could take out of the temple before the, the Romans destroyed it. Um, so this is a historical persecution of Jews, very clearly. The second picture is the kid from the ghetto, uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto uh, uprising. Um, those of you who can't see it, the, the kid who surrenders, it's a very famous picture. And the third picture is the paratroopers um, in the Wailing Wall in 1967, the occupation of Jerusalem in 1967. And in many ways, this is the Israeli narrative, this idea that everyone has always tried to kill us. The Holocaust was obviously the best example of this, and now we have an army strong enough to protect us. And that is the narrative in a snapshot. If you want another example of it, the, uh, there's a month between April and May in the Hebrew calendar, which is probably the best example, which starts with Passover. And I assume we're in the church building, so I assume everyone knows the story of Passover. <laughs> um, but Exodus from Egypt, and it's seen as a place in which the nation of Israelites is created as a nation, right? The, the liberation for persecution is a nation building exercise. Um, and I don't know how many of you have, have had Passover dinners, um, but what we sing around the table is a song that would roughly translate into, in every generation someone tries to exterminate us. This is what you remember out of Passover. A week after Passover is the Holocaust Memorial Day, a week after that is the Soldiers' Memorial Day, and the following morning is Independence Day. And again, you get the exact same picture you have here. Historically, if it's religion, if it's history, everyone has always tried to kill us. Holocaust, obviously, and people had to fight and die for you to be here today. And now, you can be here. So if that's the values that you got in your education system, the idea of joining the military is very, very clear. But, that said, there's also conscription, because these social values are not enough. Um, and officially, at least, there is conscription in Israel. That said, over 50% of the citizens of Israel do not serve in the army. Um, Israel is one of the only countries in the world that has conscription for both men and women, so it's not a question of women not serving. Um, about 20% of the people who don't serve in the army are Palestinian citizens of Israel. Palestinian citizens of Israel are automatically exempt from military service, so are ultra-Orthodox ultra Jews, at least today. This is now changing, but for now, that's still the case. Uh, religious women, there are a lot of different groups that get automatically exempt. Also, 12% of Israeli society, Israeli Jewish society, either don't start or don't finish their military service on the grounds of mental health. 
like most militaries in the world, mental health is just the easiest way out of military service. Which means that quite a lot of people who, um, I, we, the, the estimation is the majority of them do it for economic reasons, and we might be able to touch on that in the end, don't go to the army. And there's a lot of politicians who are trying to change that reality. It's very clear with the Orthodox, but today it's also, there are a lot of politicians trying to legislate laws that will make it harder for people who didn't serve in the army. Now historically you would assume that that already exists, that that's already in place. But there were a lot of people who understood that discriminating against people who didn't serve in the army was actually racist. Because in practice it's discriminating against Palestinians and the Orthodox two groups that are very marginalized within Israeli society. And so the law itself says you're not allowed to discriminate according to military service. That said, again, we have a lot of politicians who are trying to change that as we speak. Uh, this is a picture from the website of Israel Beitenu. Israel Beitenu is a political party. Um, it ran in the last election together with the Likud, Netanyahu's party. Uh, this is the second biggest party in Israeli politics. Uh, you might have heard about Lieberman, uh, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. A uh, very nice guy. Um, <laughs> and this is just an example of their uh, idea of uh, new citizens who would get new citizenship. Every new ci citizen must accept the obligation to serve in the, uh, the country in the IDF or National Civilian Service. Only those who sign the declaration will be entitled to full citizenship rights. Um, so this whole idea that you are entitled to be a citizen or to have the rights of a citizen only if you serve in the military. And again, if we think about who that really affects, it mostly affects Palestinians that are already discriminated within Israel. And I'm just talking about Palestinian citizens of Israel, not even the ones who are under military rule, supposed to be equal citizens, but in practice, they don't serve in the army. Um, and this is a, a legitimate way to discriminate against them. Uh, what we have here is a campaign of a, a Palestinian organization inside 48, inside Israel. Uh, it says, I'm not a servant which also means I do not serve. Um, and it's a campaign against national and um, military service being in inclusive now of also Palestinians. I don't know if you've heard of this, but in the last year, there's an attempt to um, start, at this point it's not a draft, it's just um, promoting enlistment within Palestinian Christians mm -hmm. inside Israel. But there's talk about adding that to, to uh, that, that that group will also be conscripted. Um, and this is a very big issue for the Palestinian society, not only because they're saying, we're not equal citizens, why would we even need to do those equal duties? Um, and saying, we'll be fighting our own people. But this is also a question of a divide and conquer policy. Um, and this has been very, very clear with the Druze. The Druze is a religious ethnic minority um, within the Palestinian community in Israel, and they are the only Arabs in Israel that are conscripted. Um, and that's true since 56. It does not mean they had equal rights. They're a very good example of showing how those two things have nothing to do with each other. They still, their villages still look like other Palestinian villages. They don't get the same amount of resources, but they do serve in the army. Um, and that has been a way to divide them from the rest of Palestinian society. And there are now Druze activists with a very strong growing refusal movement saying no we are part of the Palestinian population here um, which also means we don't we don't want to fight our brothers uh, many of them are saying we don't want to fight at all uh, it's actually a very pacifist movement as well but saying this we won't let the military service be another way to divide and conquer the Palestinian population here um, the picture on the right is a Druze refuser who spent a little over six months in military prison um, he also is plays the viola, he's a really gifted guy. Um, and, and this was a protest against the Christian uh, conscription. Now when we talk about militarization, this is my favorite part, is what we talk about when we talk about a militarized economy. And I'm sure that as Americans, you can tell me a lot about that. <laughs> um, I think you're on 59% of the congressional budget goes on military spendings, which is not bad. Um, <laughs> But, that said, um, Israel is still spending more of its, its GDP than what the U.S. is on military spending. So if you look at this here, um, the top countries uh, of military spenders from GDP, uh, we're on 6.2, you guys are on 4.4, the world average I think is on 2.5, the NATO average is on 1.8, 
we're all not in a very good place here. Um, when we t look at the budget itself, over 20% of Israel's budget um, is the budget of the Ministry of Defense. I highlighted a few others because it's not all in the Ministry of Defense. There's the Ministry of Public Security, in which the prison authority, but also the border police, which is actually a military unit, but it's officially with the police, is actually hidden in that part of the budget. Um, and then you also have here what's called special governmental agents, uh, agencies, which includes our equivalent of the CIA, the Mossad. So there's a lot of other security spendings that are hidden somewhere in that budget, but still it's the biggest budget in the country, which I have to say is not even true in the US. Um, so once again, we can beat you up in some things. And here's another one that we just beat you at last year. We are now the number one drone exporter in the world. And that is not in percentage. And this is a country that has seven million people. Um, so Israel has become a, a huge drone exporter. Um, if we look at weapons exporters in the world in general, we're always in the top 10. We sometimes move between number six and number 10 somewhere, but we're always in the top 10 in world uh, weapons export. And again, per capita, we always win. Sweden is the only competition but usually we win per capita Israel uh, exports the most weapons. And why can Israel do that? The reason that Israel is so good at exporting weapons, um, okay, I'll, I'll go to that in a second. This is a, the quote that explains it. A scenario in which there won't be a large military operation for 20 years will severely hurt the arms industries. And why? Because we can prove our weapons work. That's how we sell them. Um, and if you look at the, the chart here, Israel's export uh, and income from military industry has only grown. Um, this is the last decade. These are specific companies, the biggest weapon companies in, in Israel. Um, these two are private. The third one is going through a privatization system. So it's like in many other countries in the world, including the US, this is all about private profit. It's not even, a, even about governmental profit. Um, and this is all the time on the increase. And again, the way we can do it is that we test our weapons and we can prove to all of you that they work. And how this works, if we just take as an example, Operation Protective Edge, the last attack on Gaza um, this summer, this is a short list of all the weapon systems that made their first Operation of the Butte this summer. And this is something that Israel publicizes, right? This is how you sell weapons. You write battle proven. It's battle proven. And then people come and buy it. There was this amazing documentary called The Lab uh, by an Israeli documentarist called Yotam Feldman. Um, and he interviews an uh, Israeli general that's complaining. This was after Operation Cast Lead, the attack in Gaza in 2008, 2009. This general who's complaining that a month after every single country in the world was condemning Israel and calling in their ambassadors and screaming at them, they all sent delegations to buy the weapons. And this general is complaining, why do you scream at us? We look at it and say, why are you buying these weapons? I mean, it's so clear that the only reason um, that, I mean, Israel can afford even financially to do these things is because someone else is paying for it because you guys are very nice to us and give us $3 billion a year uh, in military aid. Um, and also because all the countries in the world keep buying from Israel these goods that were tested there and can continue this, this economy. But what that means is that we're also exporting not only the weapons, we're exporting the system. We're exporting systems of oppression. And if you look at the fence here in Arizona, um, the company that's building it is Elbit. If you remember two slides back, Elbit is an Israeli military industry company. Um, it was the one who did most of the technology on the fence that we have back home. And then when the US was thinking, oh, we're going to build the most highly militarized border in the world, that's the company they go to. Um, if you go to Brazil, these, this is a favela in Rio de Janeiro. The Israeli, uh, I mean, the, the um, I don't know how you call them in English, the armed vehicles patrolling those favelas are Israeli, which also puts us, this is the, the optimistic part, I'll try to be optimistic at the end. Um, when Now when everything was happening in Ferguson, uh, there were Palestinian activists 
who were sending tweets uh, to the activists in Ferguson explaining to them how to deal with the tear gas because we're all actually inhaling the same tear gas. We use US made tear gas um, and so does the US so they keep telling them don't keep too, uh, too much distance between you and the police, use onion, they're giving them all these tips because one of the advantages and it's, it's very sad to see how global the military economy system is but one of the advantages of that is that we're also global, that the opposition to this can also be global and can also connect a lot of different things. And in the end, I mean, the, the immigration activists here have a lot to learn from what's happening in Israel-Palestine. They'll be using the same, eventually, they'll be feeling the same policies. Um, today, there's not a single police department in the US, or, sorry, not a single state, that the police departments of them do not train in Israel. And train in Israel is not just with Israeli police, it's also with Israeli military. All of these, this global military exchange is going to hurt us all on a lot of different levels. So this is kind of the, the global picture that we want to paint. Um, I'll say a few words of what we do as the American Friends Service Committee uh, in, the, in our Israel-Palestine um, country office. We also do a lot of work here in the US, the, the Quaker United Nations office, um, which I assume at least some of you know, uh, do a lot of work on, on different issues from here as well, but I'll just talk about what we do uh, from back home. Mainly, the project that I'm working on, the Israel program, is trying to counter militarization. And the way that we're doing that is first of all supporting the young people, brave people, who are countering militarization themselves, who are choosing to uh, refuse military service, including when that means imprisonment. Today, there are two refusers in military prison as we speak, um, spending terms, one of them is, is over six months now in military prison. Um, so we're trying to support that voice in whatever way we possibly can, including bringing them here to the States and having you all listen to them, so thank you for that. Um, but then what we're also trying to do is looking into the economic system that we're talking about. So we just finished a research program that's just trying to show um, kind of highlights of what I sh showed here, but to Israeli public, to come to the Israeli public and tell them, listen, you are spending all this money on the military and the income from it is not going back to you. It's private. So it's all a privatized system that you're only losing from, but you're also testing it. Obviously, the Palestinians are the ones who pay the, the worst price for this testing, but Israelis do give up two or three of their years of their lives to be conscripted to test these weapons. The soldiers who went into Gaza this summer and died did give up their lives, among other things, to test these weapons. And this is something that Israelis don't understand, the whole economic system behind of that. So that's a project that we're trying to do as much as we can. I'll just say one word about uh, our Palestine program, which I do not work on, but it colleagues in, my, in the same office, so I don't want to share that. Um, what we are trying to do is get activists, um, Palestinian activists, from different Palestinian groups and geographical locations to work together. Because one of the things that Israel was very good at, as I said before, was divide and conquer policies. And that also means that Palestinians inside Israel and Palestinians in Gaza and Palestinians in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem all have different legal statuses, all can't meet each other, and, and the activist, the young activist scene is very segregated. So what we're trying to do is bring them together and trying to facilitate space in which they can have campaigns together and they have a very big campaign now around freedom of movement um, that has all these different groups, Palestinians from 48, 67, East Jerusalem, all working together on issues that, that are, that have to do with Palestinian unity um, in, in the struggle for freedom. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, what we do. Uh, Mark, I think we'll pass it on to you for Q&A. Abigail Metzger, Pax Christi International. Danielle, I'm curious, what started your understanding of the occupation? You say most kids your age don't know it. What was the genesis of your interest and knowledge? As a citizen, as a citizen of Israel, I'm living because of the suffer of the Palestinian. And when, if you ever ask yourself why we paid a lot of money of the security, and then I started to ask myself, why do I need to pay? My, my, why my family doing? 
uh, need to pay a lot of money for for the security and then I started to get a lot of, a lot of information why what is this security and this security is a blood cycle and the occupation and then as I said I went to the the alternative camp and I learned a lot about um, the occupation yeah um, I'm Dennis Fredo with the Lutheran office here um, I wanted to ask about uh, the situation in the Israeli economy um, specifically how much does the unemployment situation or the difficult domestic uh, economic uh, difficulties uh, contribute to, for example, violence in the West Bank, but also um, to the, um, the support for the military options within Israel? Oh, I can try to answer that. <laughs> Um, Israel is in a very strange economic situation. On the one hand, it's one of the only countries in the West that wasn't hit hard by 2008. Um, and, and on that level, we're not as much in debt as a lot of other uh, countries. Um, and the unemployment rate is actually very low. One of the things in Israel is that there's a very high employment rate, it's just not enough. It's not enough to make ends meet. Um, and today Israel is the country uh, that gets the, the highest ranking in the Gini scale in the OECD, which means we have the highest gaps between rich and poor in the OECD. Um, so it's a very strange place in which employ employment is not an issue, it's actually getting paid for the fact that you work. Um, that is much more of an issue, we're getting paid uh, a salary that you can live out of. But as far as connecting that to the occupation, unfortunately that's something that's hardly done in Israel. Um, one of the reasons for that is because it's very hard to back that with numbers. Um, we actually have no idea how much the Israeli economy makes off of the occupation. I mean, we can say what is the military export, we can say what are the different companies, international companies that set shop in the West Bank and make a profit out of it. We don't know how much of that actually comes back to Israel in taxes and so on. Um, and the other side of that is that we don't know how much money is actually spent on maintaining the occupation. Because sure, we can say the Ministry of Defense budget, but that budget is, is not transparent. The members of Knesset voting for it don't see it. So we can't say what out of that is you know, satellite pictures of Iran and what out of that is soldiers standing in a checkpoint in Ramallah. Um, so it's very hard to actually make that uh, calculation. But more than that, I think that for Israelis today, the occupation is almost a non-issue, which is for me the, the saddest thing. Um, when we, in, in 2000 and, what, it was 12 I think, or 11, uh, there was the J14 movement, it was our equivalent of the Occupy movement. Um, and it was all about, it, it was a, much like the Occupy movement, uh, it was a very middle class um, protest movement that was focused on kind of affordable living. Um, and trying to talk about what's wrong with the Israeli economic system, they wouldn't talk about the occupation. They wouldn't talk about the occupation because they said they don't want to be political, which for a protest movement was a very interesting choice. <laughs> but but that, the idea in Israel is if you talk about that thing, then you're going to alienate people, nobody's going to listen to you, so just don't, don't talk about it because it doesn't really bother us. And unless Hamas decides to uh, shoot rockets to Tel Aviv and not just to those places down south that we don't care about, we don't notice it. We don't notice the occupation on a daily basis. Um, and for me, a lot of what I think, especially the international community can do, is try to make Israel notice the occupation, or force Israel into noticing the occupation. And that goes back to the economy. Again, Israel's economy today is pretty strong, but it's a very internationalized economy. I mean, it's very dependent on other countries, on aid from other countries, but mostly on commerce from other countries. And that's why when you now see in Europe more and more restrictions on settlement products, uh, labeling settlement products, um, governments in Europe, both uh, Holland but also Britain, starting to talk about um, not uh, or warning their companies from investing in Israel because of the occupation, because of violations of international law, that starts to have an economic effect on Israelis that they can't ignore. Yeah. Your statements about uh, 
Palestinian friends or whatever saying, uh, why should I join the army? Why should I be in the army? Because I'll have to fight against my own countrymen and so on. Would you want to go through training and be in the service with the Palestinian who clearly would be more dedicated to the Palestinians than to the Israelis? Would you want that person next to you carrying a rifle and defending your country? Well, I, I wouldn't carry a rifle. So, no, I mean, <laughs> I'm not part. Try to imagine the thousands that are. And you're saying this really doesn't make sense because of discrimination and so forth. But I'm just pressing the point. Would you really not want discrimination, part of the syntax? Would you really want a Palestinian carrying a weapon on your side, knowing that when push comes to shove, he's going to be on their side, not on yours? Well, I think that the, the fact that Israel is trying to well, encourage... Me, I'm talking about you. No, no, I, I know, but I'm trying... I, I want to... Okay. I'll, I'll try to answer that on, on me, but what I'm saying is that the fact that Israel is trying to encourage Palestinian Christians to enlist is because they believe that when that if they get them to enlist, then in a decade, when they'll have the choice between whose side are they going to fight on, they're not going to be Palestinian anymore. Right. That's not going to be part Absolutely. of their identity anymore. Absolutely. So what I'm saying is the conscription is used here as a form of changing identity. Um, and I agree with you completely. Israel will definitely not try to draft all Palestinians. They're not going to give millions of people M16s and be like, well, we're going to hope you're going to use it on the right side. Changing identity is one phrase. Changing minds and approach and priorities is something else. The second thing is, in your country, um, six million, whatever you want to take, seven million, five million, a lot of different figures. When you look at the horizon and you see virtually, and I know there are people who disagree with this, but virtually every vote in the United Nations, virtually every decision made by most nations, virtually 130 million people, no, not all 130. We will take 10 million, five, I'm sorry, 10%, 5% of the people around you, officially and unofficially, because I've been there many times, and I know not only officially, but unofficially, you say, drive them into the sea, get rid of Israel. Now, you are saying, let's reduce the military budget, let's get rid of all this, uh, and there are figures which you said you didn't know, but are clearly known by some. Uh, because again, I was in that business. But you, they clearly uh, want to push you out, you Israel out. They want to destroy you. No secret about it at all. But you want to say, let's reduce our military budget. Let's become less, less militaristic. Let's stop training our kids who are going to have to fight the battles, if not this year, maybe 10 years from now, maybe five years from now. Because if you, if you look at, let's just call it recent history. This is a time for questions, not lectures. <laughs> Let me ask it, though. Just yes, please. I am. Please. Uh, when you have a lot of people who remember and know for the last 50, 60 years, countries are saying, push, push, push. Are you really, and I did ask this question, are you really willing to say, let's cut our military budget? You really want to do that? Well, I think that it's a cycle on that level. And that a you, what? It's a cycle. Of course um, it's a cycle. And, and in All order to reduce, for sure, but in order to reduce, I mean, we, we're not going to say, okay, let's just close down the idea of tomorrow. It's not a, a good idea. But what I'm saying is that at this point, because the way, the way among other things, the economy works, the, the Israeli military has an interest in continuing conflict. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is end that interest, which doesn't mean that the military collapses that day. It means that there's a need for a more sustainable solution. And as far as I'm concerned, military solutions have proved themselves unsustainable. I mean, Israel has done that for the last 70 years. It's not that we're now a safe and amazing place to live in. Right? So it's very clear that in order to, to have some kind of long-term solution, it has to be diplomatic. It cannot be based on military. And as long as our focus, economically as well, is on the military, we're not looking for other solutions. We're not looking for diplomatic ones. And you were talking about the countries surrounding us. You take the Saudi initiative. Uh, the Saudi initiative uh, was not only a two-state solution, but it was also a two-state solution that included peace agreements with all these terrible Arab countries that we're talking about that all want to kill us. They were all willing to sign a peace agreement if we'll go back to the 67 borders. But Israel wouldn't. And, and that's the point for me. The point is saying, 
this is a choice by Israel to continue to what we call living on our sword instead of finding an actual long-term security solution. Hi, I'm Nushi Framke from uh, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church. Um, thank you for your presentation and thank you for refusing to serve. Um, from what I've seen just now from your slides and your talk, um, it reminds me of a kind of a scary futuristic film or society or something that you've kind of like gotten away from. Like you're on the outside, escaped from this, um, uh, almost like a matrix type thing. Um, my question is, people like you, how much fear do you live with every day? What's, what's, what's it like to be you in this kind of society that you're kind of like, you got away? And are they trying to pull you back in? It, it just feels. <laughs> when I chose to be a refuser, I chose to be an outsider. I chose not to be part of uh, my society um, because my society don't accept me as I am. And it's hard. I, I cannot say this. It's it's not hard. But um, when more people will be aware. Uh, to the option of the refusing, of the refusing, uh, we can be more united, and we can to we can more, we can create a community um, that will be stronger and bigger, and then more people will be aware to that. Uh, Jordan Street from the Quake United Nations office, um, and I just want to ask you about your opinions on the BDS movement and BDS tactics. Um, a few of us in this room were lucky enough to see. Uh, Noam Chomsky on Tuesday and he was talking about um, our quote he said you cannot undertake actions which you think are principled if in the real world it's going to harm the victims and he said um, he believes that it's a failure of the BDS movement um, that it's actually a confrontational movement it's uh, destructive rather than constructive um, and Israeli society is quite insular and they see it as an attack on is you know like fundamental uh, parts of Israeli society, rather than an attack or a protest against the occupation. Uh, what do you think about the BDS movement? Um, that's a big one. Um, and, and you're a colleague of mine. I mean, we're <laughs> supposed to talk about these things. Um, yeah. Um, so I'll 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 start by saying that that I think that there's a. a a question here of the BDS as a call and the BDS movement, which means a lot of different things. Um, and on that level, I, I think I agree with a lot of, of what Chomsky is saying in the, in the sense of there are some actions that are doing that are alienating people rather than, than drawing them in. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to say on a value base. On a value base, I think that, as was said, it's, it's a very clear request from the Palestinians saying, if you are against this, stop funding it which is the most fundamental thing you can possibly ask, um, as I have been invited here by the Presbyterians. Um, I can say that, I mean, the Presbyterians did this summer make that resolution, which was exactly that. It was just saying these are values that, or, or these companies are involved in human rights violations that contradict our values. We're not going to pay for it or make a profit out of it in, in investment. That's all they're saying. Um, and on that level, I think it's a very clear-cut value-based um, argument. When we talk about the strategy, then I think it's very much a question of how you do it. And I do want to say that most of the campaigns in the movement today are very strategic. And they're things like what we see in church divestment um, that are very, very clear on saying this is not a call for the annihilation of Israel or anything of the sort. This is saying we will not fund things that we're against. Um, this is also true for the biggest student campaigns here in the States, like the TIA CREF campaign. Very clear strategic campaigns. There are campaigns that are not like that, that are, I will say, or activists that say anti-Semitic things. Um, and when we talk about things that are counterproductive, but this is not only counterproductive, it's also just morally wrong, yes, they exist, but they don't represent anything. And I think that the fact that we keep going back to them, the majority of the movement is not there at all. The TIA Kref campaign is run mostly by Jewish Voice for Peace, very far from anti-Semitism. Um, I, I mean, this, 
so for me, it's much more a question of how do we do this in the most strategic way possible. And as far as what you were saying about uh, kind of um, alienating Israelis, I think that one of the important things to say is, I mean, that's sad. <laughs> that as a movement, we will be alienating Israelis. That said, if, if the other side of that is Palestinians are living under military rule. So it's sad if, if Israelis don't like us anymore, but this is more important. And on the next level of that, if you go back to South Africa, I've been a few times to South Africa lately, and all the activists keep saying, the white activists, uh, the, the white uh, um, authority was kept saying, all this world is against us, and it just became more and more racist and extremist. And yes, there was a backlash to the international boycott, there was. But eventually, it also gave leverage to people fighting for freedom, and that's what we're trying to create here. Rob, Trey, Rob, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> it, it all works. Israel Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church. Uh, first of all, thank you for stating very clearly what action we took this summer because often it's stated in an incorrect way, and that was a perfect summary. Um, <laughs> um, I've heard a lot of answers to this question. I'd be very, yours would be very useful. Uh, one of the, the major push backs from especially American Jewish organizations is this anti-Semitic card. Uh, how would you begin to explain the position against the occupation as not being an anti-Semitic position? What sorts of catchphrases, what sorts of points would you, would you take us to, to use in that charge, against that charge? To both of you, actually. Okay. Um, so, I, I think for me, in many ways, the question is weird. I mean, why is being against the occupation anti-Semitic? Where, and, and, and the connection is for me what we need to challenge. The fact that, and this is, has been something that, that Israel has been very good at, is first of all, saying that it represents the world Jews, which is not true. Majority of world Jews do not live in Israel, choose not to live in Israel. Um, and, and, and that's one point. And the fact that Israel keeps making those the same is very problematic, and I think it's, it's an, one of the objectives of us as a movement is to make that separation. Um, and then you have the next, the next step of that, which is saying that any criticism of, Isra of the occupation is calling for the annihilation of Israel, which is once again just not true. Um, and, and so for me, a lot of it is just dividing and saying Judaism is one thing, Israel is another thing, Zionism is another thing, and the occupation is another thing. And you can find individuals that are any of those identities alone without the others. And I mean, it's completely different things. So one of the things is just dismantling that. And I mean, I know you've been working on uh, deconstructing Zionism. Is that what it's called? Zionism and Zionism yeah. and I'm sorry. Um, but, but a little bit of just opening what that ideology also is. And, and um, so I think that that's a really important uh, angle of it. The other one is so showing for me, and this is something that, that uh, I feel very strongly around, especially when I speak to activists in Europe and travel there, um, where anti-Semitism is something that they feel much more on their flesh. Um, and and there, one of the things that they keep saying is, for us as Jews to feel safe here, we need to make that disconnect. We can't be affiliated with things that we don't vote for, we're not engaged in, we have nothing to do with, but we do suffer from them. And they do increase anti-Semitism. And for that, on that level, the way to battle anti-Semitism is to end the occupation. Because in a way, it's legitimizing anti-Semitism. There are anti-Semites out there that today say things that I can't say anything but you're right, although they're anti-Semites. And, and I don't want to give them fuel. Um, so on that level, fighting anti-Semitism would be ending the occupation. Um, I think she said L. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, Ryan Smith with the Presbyterian Church. Um, wondering if uh, your decision to to refuse military service comes from a place of faith, and if so, how has your faith community either supported you or not supported you in this journey? Well, the occupation, it's not, it's not something that I think there, there is an occupation. There is an occupation. The Palestinians are suffering every day. And I don't think it, it is a matter of fate. 
אפילו מה שמתכוון זה עם, עם האמונות, במקרה הזה, הדתיות שלך. אה. היה להם איזושהי השפעה. No, no, there is no effect of um, um, orthodoxic faith that it's something. Yeah, we, we both don't come from a faith-based background. Okay. Um, that said, today one of the refugees that's in prison, the one who's there for over six months now, uh, is Orthodox, Orthodox Jewish. Um, the community itself is not very supportive. Uh, there isn't a lot of a very clear anti-occupation voice within the Orthodox community. Um, but, but you do find activists uh, from religious backgrounds as well, in this case Jewish religious backgrounds, um, that uh, there's an organization called Rabbis for Human Rights, which does amazing work and is very much based on the idea of, of social justice values and peace values within Judaism um, and the fact that the only way to today to, to implement that is among other things to combat occupation. Uh, Doug Hostetter with the Mennonite Central Committee. A couple of questions. Um, one, um, as an Israeli, uh, do you feel like your nation is like the pre-67 borders? And then do you feel like everyone that lives within those borders should have equal rights and citizenship or something else? It would be interesting for me to understand what you believe yourself or your ideal for yourself and your country. And the second has to do a little bit with some of the changing attitudes that are happening in this country with regard to um, Israel. Uh, the total support for Israel, unquestioning support for Israel that used to come totally from uh, the Jewish community uh, is now that consensus is breaking up a little, especially among young, younger Jews. So you have J Street, you have Jewish Voice for Peace. And at the same time, um, you are having evangelical Christians that are now giving um, unquestioning support to Israel. Uh, so you're getting probably comparable support from the United States, but it is shifting a bit from Jewish to evangelical Christian uh, and, um, and conservative Republicans uh, who also are giving unquestioning support. I would just be interested in your reflection on that as, as an Israeli. <laughs> Okay, um, so I'll start with the second one. Uh, maybe a little bit easier, though I'm not sure. Um, I mean, first of all, the, the Jewish lobby um, and the evangelical lobbies are also very different on different administrations. The Jewish lobby mostly has an effect on, on a democratic administration. 80% of Jews in the US vote democratic. Um, and the evangelical, obviously, has much more of an effect on Republican administrations um, in, in general terms. Um, but, but as you said, I mean, it, it's, it's very clear that the Jewish voice is breaking up and, and the evangelical one is not as much. Um, and I actually think this is probably much more a question to you. I mean, I know Presbyterians, Mennonites, Quakers, you're very far from the evangelicals, um, or at least the conservative Republican ones. Um, we hope. Thank but, you. <laughs> <laughs> but that Someday, said, some days. still closer than we are. Um, yeah. But I, I spent uh, the um, a month uh, here in the U.S. Um, and Canada speaking with evangelical churches, uh, with World Vision, um, about the occupation uh, and militarization. Um, and I think it was very interesting to see, and, and to be fair, we did go to the more progressive um, churches within uh, that community, but still a very conservative community. And it was very interesting to see, first of all, the majority of them have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. And on that level, when you actually break it down to them, they're much more willing to hear and to change their position. And that's something that, that needs to be done. Um, and we met with quite a lot of evangelical pastors, um, hoping that they'll, they'll pass that forward uh, to, to their own um, communities. But, but that, that was, it was amazing to see how much it was just based on a complete lack of knowledge. Um, this is very instrumental, so I apologize for saying this, but I still will. Um, one of the things that, that spoke to that community very strongly is speaking about Palestinian Christians. 
and the fact that although they have this automatic, it's Muslims versus Jews, and obviously we're all for the Jews, um, because that's how the Messiah will come. Uh, although they have that, at the same time, they have no idea that they're Apostolic Christians, mm -hmm. and that they are occupied, mm -hmm. and that they're oppressed not by Muslims. They're oppressed by the state of Israel. Um, and that is an, an important entry point in a way to, to be able to talk a little bit about the realities of, of what's going on. Um, I, I just will say that as an Israeli, that specific support is one of the craziest things that I think is happening in, in the sense of the Israeli right wing politics that accept not only political support from these groups, but also economic support to build settlements. There's, um, what's it called? Uh, Christians for Settlements, Evangelicals, I don't remember what the organization is called, but literally they just collect money for settlements. Uh, but the fact that the right wing in Israel is willing to take that money that comes with a very clear agenda of saying, we, forgive me for saying this, but we hope that you will all move there so the Messiah will come and you will all burn in hell, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty crazy that, that, that Israeli politics is not affected by that. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's something we need to start talking about with our right-wing politicians of saying, who are you dealing with? Um, yes. Well, I mean, I, but I do think there's a lot of changing within the evangelical community, it's yeah. especially with the younger folks over the past several years. So I think that, um, and they might still be very conservative on other theological issues, but you're right, when they go there, when they, when they learn about Palestinian Christians, I think there's a real shift within the evangelical communities as well. Right. Well, um, as you ask, because <laughs> well, the solution is not uh, to countries. Um, I'm not supporting this idea. And I also uh, think um, um, one of the, the solutions need to be uh, support uh, DBS. And um, to spread the awareness of refusing and the occupation. Um, I might just add to that a little bit. Um, I, when we talk about the one state, two state, what will be the final, um, I'm not going to end that sentence. <laughs> um, <laughs> what will be the final situation uh, after this ends? Um, we have, uh, I mean, usually the discourse is between one state and two state. Uh, and we used to say, I'm gonna, when I was young, we used to say um, that the one state solution is just not realistic. And that's why we have to be talking about the two state solution. You open a map today and you say the two state solution doesn't seem that realistic. Where are you gonna build it? You look at the amount of settlements, the, the control on water, the control on, on land that will be able to in the future be developed, all these things. You look at a map and you don't know where that Palestinian state will be, where it can be sustainable. Um, so in a, in a some level, this opens up a new possibility because we don't have to think realistic anymore. There is no realistic solution. So we can sh start thinking what we actually want. Um, and on that level, I think that, that for me, and, and I'll say this, this is my opinion, uh, AFC does not sign on to any specific uh, solution. Um, but for me, it's a, I would like to see something in the middle um, to be able to say that there will be one federal government meaning freedom of movement, meaning access to religious, uh, all religious um, uh, places and things of the sort, but at the same time to allow cultural autonomies, religious, li lingual autonomies, and to understand these are two, more than two, I would say, um, very different cultures. Uh, and that you can have that, and we have models in the world in Switzerland, in Canada, in Belgium, there are different models of binational states that allow both that, that cultural autonomy and at the same time one federal law. Um, so that would be the, the direction I would come. Um, I was just wondering if I could ask uh, Danielle uh, quite a specific question on the actual steps and the process you had to take to become a conscience objector. Mm -hmm. What do you do? I mean, when you want to refuse. Oh, um, there is um, some, there is uh, some processing uh, if you want to go to the jail or if you want to I, I went out from the military on mental issues I have to say to the uh, idea that I have mental issues uh, and then they free me away and <laughs> and yeah um, there is um you can go out on 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 a lot of things but um 
I think uh, I I didn't went out on uh, I didn't uh, went to uh, the IDF uh, to be present because in Israel um, to be uh, in refuser it's it's really hard as I said so before if you want to be a refuser you becoming an outsider and also I need the protection of my family and I didn't get that from my family and uh, I need this privilege to to do this act and if I don't have it it's really hard because I can also hurt my family at their jobs their daily life etc and, uh, and, and the people in jail at the moment they would they not have uh, had uh, mental health excuses and they would have they just took a moral stance on it or would it have been are there different reasons for why you would be imprisoned? No, when you say that you... So, so I was saying that there's two, two refusers in jail. Yeah, time. there is two. two. And the, the reasons for the extended stay in the jail are... What, what are the reasons? They are refusing the IDF. Yeah. So um, well, well it's a, it's in a way, it's a question of a choice. Okay. <laughs> refusing and going to prison is a choice. Um, in the sense because you, you choose not to try to get out through mental health, which, which usually if you try enough, you'll manage. And the reason that people do that, and again, as Danielle was saying, it is a question of privilege and how much support you have to be able to do that. Uh, but the reason that people do that is because they want to make a statement. Um, so it's, a, it's their choice and in a way it, it rallies um, political discussion, media attention to be able to, to take that uh, and, and push forward the agenda of the letter in general. So there's no official conscientious objectors status? There is, oh. yes. Uh, there is an official conscientious objectors um, status. There's a military committee. It's one of the only countries in the world with, where the, the committee deciding on this is, is fully military. Um, and so as a 17-year-old kid, you would send a letter to the army declaring you want to be recognized as a conscientious objector. Uh, they only recognize pacifists in the most narrow definition of pacifism you can possibly imagine. Um, and then you have to go and stand in front of 10 generals and convince them that serving in the army is immoral. Um, the whole situation in general is pretty absurd. We've had people ask, uh, you're standing in a gun in front of Hitler, what do you do? Um, you know, questions that we obviously all deal with in our daily life. Um, so it's, it's a very hard committee to actually pass. It does officially exist. Okay, okay now, so I, I see Abigail. It'll have to be a quick question with a quick answer. Uh, Danielle and Sahar have a uh, train, right? We do. I knew it was a method of conveyance. I couldn't remember which. They have a train to catch. I just wanted to ask if you um, were able to refuse on the point of mental health issues, mm -hmm. but you signed that letter, mm -hmm. what kind of jeopardy does that put you in? Because that sort of changes the dynamic a little bit by signing such a very specific letter about the occupation. And the second half was, what what happens afterwards now to you and to the other refusers? If you refuse on a point of mental health, ver, um, but have signed the letter or um, more to go to jail, will you ever be able to work in Israel? Like, will the, is your... Um, Occupy, you know, are you okay, able to um, work? I guess it's not interesting with me at all. <laughs> it's not, a, it's not uh, a matter of question. It's when you are uh, got out from the IDF, they're not interested in you anymore. You are free. Um, when you are uh, out from, um, uh, from um, mental health or something like that, um, um, the, you can do, you can walk in almost the uh, most jobs, but you cannot work in bank or in the government. Well, on behalf of the Israel-Palestine Working Group, I thank each of you for being here. Uh, I also thank Sahar and Danielle for their presentation, their time, their witness. Uh, this is their, uh, kind of how I learned this was Danielle's first presentation ever. This is their first presentation on about a 20-stop tour. Uh, and so we're honored uh, both to have them here with us today for their first presentation, but it, it is truly an honor to hear your witness uh, for the first time, Danielle, and thank you so much for sharing that with us.